SQL, the language of databases, and so much more. This tutorial is for anyone wishing to learn SQL in a step-by-step -step approach. Hi, I'm Charu, an instructor with SAS Institute. Here's a little background on me. You can also find me on blogs.sas.com. On the agenda today, I'll cover five topics. We'll first learn the syntax order in which you can submit queries to SQL, and then we'll summarize data using the Boolean. Thirdly, we'll manage metadata using dictionary tables, and then we'll learn to join tables. And lastly, we'll internalize the logical order in which SQL processes queries. Let's begin with section one. Here we're going to get an overview of PROC SQL. We initiate the SQL procedure with a very simple PROC SQL statement, and we terminate it with a quit statement. In between, we can have multiple statements within the step. Two things SQL always needs, which are mandatory, is number one, what do you want? And number two, where do you want it from? The what do you want is the select clause. And on the select clause, we'll be listing the columns and the order in which we wish to display them. The where do you want it from is the from clause on which we specify the from statement. And we can query up to 256 tables on the from clause. Here is the entire SQL syntax order. Now, Sometimes we know many languages, both spoken and computer, and it may be hard to keep track of the order, the grammar, the logic. So I have a mnemonic for you here. And here is my mnemonic. So few workers go home on time. Isn't that easy? You have the select and then the from. The two statements select and from are not enclosed in triangular brackets, indicating they are mandatory. Anything else is optional. So let's go ahead and begin our demonstration to examine the syntax order. I've invoked SAS, and I'm using the windowing environment as my interface of choice. Now, I'd like to open up a program that will assign libraries. But even before I do that, a little shortcut I'd like to share. If I head over to View and open up my favorite folders, I should see my folder structure. I'm going to navigate to the C drive data, or rather C drive and how. And within that, I have the folder I wish. And within that, further down, I have all the folders for this demonstration. I'll open up the exercises folder. And on the right side, I'll see a listing of all the programs. Just going to resize this here a little bit. So now in future, if I wish to open up a program to demo it, all I need to do is double click and not have to go through the file open, etc. So I'll launch this program, press F3 to execute, check the log, verify that the library was successfully assigned. I have a little warning above, which is about my license about to expire in May, so I need to renew the license. I'll open up libraries, and there is my SGF 2020 library. I'll go to view detail view so I can see the data sets that I will be using for this demonstration. Next, I'd like to explore the syntax order. I'll open up the first program here. Here, what I'm trying to do is gather information from the employee information data set. And I'd like to get these three columns in this order, employee ID, employee gender, and salary. So I'll list them on the select. I'll go ahead and execute with the F3. And in the results viewer, I'll indeed see these three columns and all the rows in that table. That was pretty straightforward. Now let's en enhance this a little further. Let's open up a second program. Here what I'm trying to do, the business scenario, is gather information about all the employees who are female. And I'd like to get these three columns listed in this order. And I'd also like to order the data by salary in descending order. One thing that will be very clear from this code is the closeness to the English language in SQL. The order by, the where, the from pretty much do 
what the word is saying here. So the select is going to gather all the columns in the order of syntax. The next statement is the from. It's going to extract information from this table. The where class is going to filter the rows or subset them for the condition that I've requested. And the order by is going to order salary in descending order. I'll hit F3, execute, and I'll get the information I requested. And we'll notice that salary is displayed in descending order, just as we requested. And gender is all female. If you go further down, you'll see it has only filtered for the female employees. For the next piece of code that I'll open up, I have a question for you. And the question is, will this code work? When you see the order of statements, if you recall the select and then the from, was it the order by? No, it was the where clause that appeared next. So we'll see what happens when we submit code where we haven't respected the syntax order of SQL. Nothing happens, there is no result. And if I look at the log, there is a note that says, I have a syntax error and I don't expect what you gave me and I'm going to ignore you. And the SAS system stopped processing this step. So it didn't go any further. It just came to a complete stop. The fix we will make is right here. We'll just switch the order in which the where and the order by appear so that our request to SQL appear in the order SQL would like to see them, the where clause and then the order by. Will this code work? Absolutely. You'll see results and you'll see the data displayed in the order that you requested. As a SQL coder who's maybe just starting their um, SQL learning, it would be useful to learn of an option. And this option appears in our next program. An option called noexec, which will ex explicitly check for syntax errors without executing the code. So noexec stands for exactly what it says there. I'll execute this code. And again, no results. I'll head over to the log. And the log will have a note that says statement not executed due to the no exec option. That's a handy option to use. And the next time we execute code, now that we know that there is no error in this piece of code, the next time we execute it, we'll just remove the no exec option so that the code will indeed execute. Hands down, summarizing data using the Boolean gate in Proc SQL has to be my all-time favorite technique. When I fell in love with its elegance, I captioned my blog, number one best programming technique for 2012. That's how impressive this technique is. The Boolean is simply the digital computing world's way of converting everything to zeros and ones. Simply put, a yes is a one and a no is a zero. Let's go ahead to the demonstration for section two. This section is about summarizing using the Boolean. So there are really two concepts here, summarizing and the Boolean. Before we get to the Boolean, let's learn to summarize in SQL. In my first piece of code, I have a business scenario. I've been requested to get a report which, that shows average salary by gender. So that's what I'll do here. And on the proc SQL statement, I also see an option which says number. And this is going to make sure that the output, the results will have the row numbers. By default, they don't print. And this will ensure it. On the select statement, as we saw in section one, I list all the columns I want, employee gender being one of them. And then the second column is an average of salary. I'm using the average function on salary. As average indicates that this is an alias, this is how I'll allude to this new column. The from clause lists the table, and the where clause is going to filter or subset the data for any condition I request. Here my condition is, give me those employees whose termination date is missing, which means these are active employees. I'll execute this code using my F3 key, and what I see in the result and what I expected to see are quite different. What I was really expecting to see is two rows of data. 
one for male and one for female, and each row indicating the average. As I scroll through the data, thanks to the option number, I can see the row number. I can see there's 308 rows in this table. But I haven't got just two rows. This has given me every single row in the table. In addition, it's given me the average that doesn't look like it's different for the two genders. So that means um, I need to do something else. Before that something else, let's go back to the log. Let's see what the log told me. The log says something very interesting. The query requires re-merging summary statistics back with the original data. Hmm, what does that mean? Let's explore the results again. And let's see what SQL did here. Oh, by the way, before we look at the results, let's look at the code. We had what SQL calls a detail column gender. And we also had on the select what SQL calls a summary column, average of salary. And SQL says, whatever you give me on the select, I'm forced to give you that. So it's forced to give me this detail employee gender. Now, it gave me the average all right. It just didn't give me the average I wanted. It gave me the average for the entire table. And this is the note in the log. It requires remerging summary statistics back with the original data. The results, what did SQL do? With each individual row, it went and stacked the average for the entire table. This is for the entire organization, not just broken by gender. So to break it down by gender, we'll introduce a new statement, the group by. The group by statement will guarantee that I now have the data broken into male and female gender. Something to be aware of about the group by and to know what column would be a good candidate, any column that is a detail column qualifies excellently for the group by. You typically wouldn't say group by average salary. You wouldn't put a summary column on the group by. I'll execute this code. And I'm very happy with the results that have been returned. One row for female, one row for male, and the average for each group. Let's try to take this knowledge a little further in our second business scenario. In this scenario, I'd like to see the employee count by department. So I know from the previous example that the group by statement is needed to group data. I also know that department would be a good candidate. So on the select, I'm going to list the columns I need. Department certainly. I've been asked for employee count by department. So by department is going to be my grouping department. That is one column. My second column gives me the count. This is a function, count asterisk, whose role is to count the number of rows that a query will provide. So with this, code, I should expect to see the number of rows for each department. And voila, we do. We see the number of rows for each department. Incidentally, the rows are not in order by count. We didn't, we didn't expect it. We didn't uh, require it. But we'll do so in the next example. I'd like to add a little further to this piece of code. I'd like to now provide a result where I'm only going to get those departments that have 25 or more employees. In addition, I'd like to see the results in descending order of employees. Here's the code that's going to do it. We have the group by, and then we have a having. Why did we need the having? Let's go back to the previous code. Let's add the where clause. And if I remember my knowledge of the where, it goes after the from. I'm going to say where count is greater than or equal to 25. Will this work? No results indicates I need to check the log. And the log comes back and returns to me this note. The following columns were not found in the table. So let's expand on that a little bit and the role of the WHERE clause. The WHERE is one of the most powerful statements in pretty much any programming language, and SQL is no different. 
And the reason the where is so powerful is it's a preprocessor. It acts on existing data. What does it consider existing data? Uh, existing data is any column that comes from a table on the from. So that's one thing to remember about the where. The second thing to remember about the where is that it acts on raw data or individual rows. It doesn't act on summary data, right? So that's what was the problem in the log. So that means a where clause will not be able to cut through or filter my data. It's a difference between buying apples in a grocery store, raw apples and how I cut them, versus buying an apple pie and how I cut the apple pie. Here, we have an apple pie. Think of the count as an apple pie. It's completely processed. It no longer resembles apple, and I want to go ahead and slice it. So the where, the knife of the where will not work. And that is why we have a new statement called the having. The role of the having is to take the group data and filter that group data. So this is going to work. I'm going to say having count greater than or equal to 25, and I'll order by count in descending order. Let's submit this code. And these are the employee counts in those departments with at least 25 employees. And the results are in order of count in descending order. So now we understand how grouping works, how to filter or cut through group data. Let's go ahead and begin to understand our business scenario for the Boolean. So here is my code. And the code itself needs a little breaking down. So let's break it down. So here's my business scenario. I'd like to create a report that gives me the total number of managers, the total number of employees in each department. And I'd like also like to see the manager employee ratio. Now this itself is a pretty complex ask. On the same row, for example, let's look at row one accounts. I'd like to see both the managers and the employees. And if we start to think about this, typically what we would get is either the managers or the employees, but the ask is quite complex. So let's break it down further to see how the Boolean will come to our help here. Firstly, we'll try to figure out if someone is a manager or not. We we'll look at the job title column to get this information. And how do we figure this out? We are going to use a find function in a Boolean expression and convert everything to a one if we find a manager and a zero if we don't find the word manager in that job title. Here's how the find function works. An example of the find function on job title. Here's one row of data. This is the administration manager. And on the find function, I need to give it two things primarily, the string that I'm interested in, which is job title, and the substring within that that I'm looking for, which is manager. Now, data is not always very clean. Sometimes the way I get it has uppercase manager or lowercase. In order to circumvent that, I'll add the I modifier, which says, I'm not sure if manager is uppercase or lowercase. Please ignore case. How do we take this? And if we go back to that, this is going to give me column position 16 is the first instance of the word manager. Well, that's not a one or a zero. How do I convert that into a one? Very cleverly. We'll provide the statement, find job title manager i greater than zero. Is 16 greater than zero? Yes. What is the yes to the computer? A one. If it doesn't find the word manager, SQL going, going to return a zero. Is zero greater than zero? No. What is a no for, for the Boolean? A false, right? So in this manner, we are going to have a column which will have zeros and ones, zeros where it didn't find the word manager, ones where it found it. Let's head over to the demonstration to see how we apply this to a code. Here we go. We have one column 
where we, we have, sorry, we have the select statement where we have department as the first column. And then we have one column that's going to calculate the column for managers, another column that's going to create for me the employees, and the last column that's going to divide the two. So in the first manager column, I have the find function, and that's going to give me zeros and ones. If I say greater than zero, that's going to give me all the ones, and that's going to give me a list of managers. If I sum it up, then I will see that grouped by department, which we will be grouping at the end. I'll do the same thing for the employees. I'll go ahead and say, find for me within job title the word manager, and that should be a zero, which means no instance of the word manager. That's going to create a column for employees. I wrap the entire find function with the sum, so that will give me the sum of the number of employees for each department. I'm always remembering the fact that I have a group by going on here. And then it's as easy as dividing managers by employees. We are seeing the appearance of a calculated keyword. When is that used? The calculated keyword is used to reference a column that you have just built in your ProxySQL query. These are not existing columns. These have been built by me. So I use a calculated keyword, calculated managers divided by calculated employees. Now, uh, this column is rather a long column, and I don't want it to give it a long name. So I provide a label that is a shorter label, M slash E ratio. And then I use a format of a percent eight period one. The from statement is then going to specify the table from which I need to extract the data, and lastly, the group by. Amazingly elegant, this solution is going to give us the results we need. With the help of the Boolean, we've managed to get the managers, the employees, two different groups of data together on one row, so we see count for each of them, by department, as well as the manager-employee ratio. Let's get started with section three. Now, there's no magic pill that will forgive us for not knowing our data. Know thy data must be the most fundamental principle that cannot be ignored. In fact, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that this is the only rule primarily that data workers must know. Everything else is SaaS. To help navigate through the inherited and sometimes messy data, my go-to suggestion is dictionary tables. I love dictionary tables and cannot imagine life without them. I'm sure you'll feel the same way once we reveal the value of dictionary tables. So let's proceed to the demonstration for dictionary tables. Since dictionary tables is really new to us and we don't know what sits in this dictionary table, we'll go and first use a describe table statement to describe the content of dictionary.tables. I can check the log now. And in the log, I'll see a description of the metadata of this table. So now this makes it clear that the column names called live name is a library name, nobs is number of physical observations, and var is a number of variables. So if I wish to query this table, I now can ask for specific columns. Now we've used in the dictionary tables code, we've used dictionary.tables, and these views are specific to SQL. If you want in your remainder of the SAS world to access dictionary tables, then you would head over to the SAS help library, and within there, you'll find them listed. So as I scroll further down in the SAS help library, anything that begins with the letter V, which is probably towards the bottom, is indicative of a dictionary table. So if I'm trying to find the exact match dictionary.tables, then I'm looking for something called V table. So in the SAS help library, 
we'll insert the letter B before the table name and then strike out the S at the end. I'll move further in my business scenario. Now that I know what the columns are in this dictionary table, I can start to analyze and request all tables that have an ID type column. But even before that, I like to see all tables in the SAS help library, and I like to explicitly list the columns I need. This is a big help. Running the previous piece of code with the described tables gave me this intelligence. So once I submit this, I'll get a listing of the tables in the SAS help library and the columns that are requested. I can now continue into my code and request just those columns, just those tables that have the ID column. So here's a program. Within the dictionary.columns dictionary table, I'm interested in the table name, which is the column called mem name, and the name of the column, where this is the library, and I want to restrict my search to only those columns which contain ID. Now, I'm not sure because my data can sometimes be dirty. I'm not sure if the ID is lowercase or uppercase. So I add the upcase function to limit my search. As I scroll through the results, I see that the letters ID appear in all the column names, whether it's message ID or it's table ID or it's source ID. However, a limitation of this technique is my having to explicitly ask for the words ID, letter ID. Now, this was useful because it tells me what ID type columns exist. But what if I want to know all columns that have the same name and I don't know what those names are? And this is something we learn to do in the next piece of code. We'll utilize technique from the previous section here. I'll go ahead and query dictionary.columns. I limit my search to the SAS help library. I'll group the query by name name, type, length, and mem name are listed on the select. And then I'll go and filter through and only ask to filter the group data for those rows where the count of name is greater than one. And that's pretty clever. So I'm saying only give me those names that appear more than once. And voila, here we go. The column called actual appears in three tables, PRD sale two, three PRD sale. A column called air appears in two tables. I really removed a hard coding, which I did in the previous example, where I explicitly asked for ID. This time I made the query more dynamic by asking the query, to go investigate dictionary tables and find for me all columns which have the same name. This is going to hold us in good stead when we learn techniques in the next section to join tables and where we might not know what are the column common columns by which to do a join. In section four, we're going to learn to join tables using conditions like inner join and reflexive join. So first up, SQL uses joins to combine tables horizontally. Requesting a join means we want matching data from one row in one table with a corresponding row in a second table. Typically, we perform matches on one or more columns in the two tables. A picture says a thousand words. So here is a visual that shows us the kinds of joins we can support in SQL. Inner joins are going to give us that green highlighted piece, only the matching rows. Outer joins can give us either a left outer join, which is the matches, which is the green piece, and then the yellow piece, the non-matches from the left table. A right join is going to give me matches again, the green piece, and the blue piece, which is non-matches from the right table. And a full join gives me all matches and non-matches. 
So how do we uh, write a join on a query on the from clause when we have multiple tables? This is going to give me a join, but this is going to give me quite an interesting join. This result is called a Cartesian product. It's going to give me all possible combinations. So let's see what that looks like. The Cartesian product is barely the desired result of a query. Here, it's taken row one from table one to row one to table two, row one to two, row one to three, row two to one, row two to two, row two to three. And eventually, we don't know whether the first row, Smith, has an ID of 101 or 102. The IDs are not matching. So it's good to emphasize that this is barely or rarely the desired result of a query. And it's important to know that this actually can happen accidentally if we don't supply a condition. How would we supply a condition? How do we limit the rows to exactly what we want? We'll do that in an inner join syntax. So let's proceed to the demo. Let's begin our first exercise in the join section. I'm trying to combine the customers table with the transactions table. The customers table has one row for each customer and their demographics and the transactions table has their transactions itself, detailed information. I'd like to really see with this code if I can get customers who placed a transaction. I have a select asterisk and the select asterisk indicates requesting all columns, not specific columns, but every single column. Submitting this code is going to give me matching three rows with three rows. This gives me the infamous Cartesian product. Three times three, the table grew exponentially. In addition, we don't know if row one for Smith belongs to ID 101 or 102. And so we get all possible combinations. To limit our search to matching rows only, we'll head over and punch in code that looks like this. Still combining the two data sets, Still collecting all the columns from the two tables listed on the from clause. The difference is the addition of the where clause. This is the same where clause that we used as a subsetting statement or a filter in earlier sections. This time, it also provides, it acts like the statement that provides a join condition. We are joining based on equal values of ID. Now, SQL has, if you look at the results from the previous segment, SQL has this unique ability to provide the same column with the same name multiple times from multiple tables. The data step would only give us one instance of ID, not so much SQL. So now in this new piece of code, we want to ask for ID from the customer's table or an equal value of ID in the transactions table for matches. However, since ID is in both the tables, I need to qualify it by heading it up with the table name. Submitting this code will execute and give me matches only. So this was my inner join. It gave for me the customer blank who made a purchase. This is only one customer. Now I do notice that ID appears twice and if I head over to my code, this is why. The asterisk gave me all columns and ID appeared from both the tables. To get only one instance of ID, I'm going to have to request only for one ID column and remove the select asterisk. So here we've asked, and the question that might come up is, I have two IDs, I have ID from customers, I have ID from transactions, which one do I pick? And in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter because this is an inner join. So it's a matching row. And so whether I see customers.id or transactions.id, I would expect to get the same result. I'll execute this code. And I also want to point out that you don't have to qualify name, action, and amount. These are columns that don't sit on the same table, on multiple tables rather. 
customer ID is the only column that is coming from both the data sets. A much nicer looking report. No instance of duplicate ID columns, just one instance and the other columns that are requested. In the code that we just submitted, we had to type customers and we had to type it again. And this can be quite um, a lot of work. So to avoid that kind of work, I can give aliases for each table that are short and sweet. An alias can be as short as one letter or can be multiple letters. So this time when I use ID from the customers table, I qualify it with C.ID. Or if I use ID from the transactions table, I qualify it with T. The only caveat, I list the alias the first time on the from clause. Subsequently, I can use the aliases anywhere. So as programmers, we are always interested in efficiency of the computing world, of our processing. But here, I'd also like to highlight a little bit of efficiency in lesser typing work. Next, we learn how to join a table back with itself. This is also called a reflexive join or a self-join. In the business scenario, the chief sales officer would like to see a report with the names of all sales employees as well as the employee's direct manager. In order to do this, we have to build the query in this manner. We'll first need to read the addresses table once. We're actually going to read it twice. The first time, we'll grab the employee's ID and name. So here is the first row. John has an MP ID of 100. Next, we'd like to know who's John's manager. In order to do that, we need to head over to the organization table. This table has two columns, MP ID and manager ID. So in order to get John's manager, I, John's manager and the manager ID for John, we'll have to go to the organization table. And if you're trying to think of the select, we almost want to think of select manager ID, where addresses.mp ID equals organization.mp ID. So now we've got the manager ID for John's manager but we don't know the manager's name. In order to do that, we'll head back to the addresses table, read it again. So this is the second read of the addresses table. This time, we'll go and find the name for this manager ID. So in terms of the query that we'll craft, we'll be saying select manager emp name as manager name, where manager ID from organization table equals the addresses MP ID. This is quite an interesting new concept where we are reading a table twice. So we're going to list the same table twice on the select, on the from clause. In order to do that, SQL is perfectly okay with us listing the table as many times as we want on the from clause, but it does tell us to qualify the table and provide different aliases. So the first time we read the table as employee, we'll qualify it as E, and the second time we'll give it an alias of M. Let's head over to the demonstration now. Here is the completed syntax for a self-join. Let's begin with the from clause and let's decode that first, because here's where the self-join really appears. We have the addresses table appearing once as employee, so we give it an alias of E. Then we have the addresses table appearing as manager, so we give it an alias of M. The organization table is not repeated more than once. We still give it an alias to make our life easy later on when we need to use columns on this table so we don't have to type the long organization word. On the where clause, Based on this slide presentation, we saw how we were combining different columns for the join condition. And also, we had another filter, department needs to contain this string called sales. Once you've done that, we can look at the select where we grab 
specific columns from each table. We'd like to see EMP ID and EMP name from the employee table. Also give that a label. We like to grab employee ID and employee name from the manager table and give that a label as well as country. Lastly, we order by country and here is something interesting. We are ordering by country, which is a column, as well as column number four. This is what that integer says on the order by. Give me column four on the select, which is this column. Why did we need an integer position and not a column name? It's because we never gave it an alias. So in order to use it, we give a column number. Same thing applies for column one. Let's go ahead and submit this code. And here we are. For each employee, we see the name as well as the manager that they report to and the manager's name as well as the country that they are from. In this section, we'll explore ProxySQL's logical query processing order. In the first section, I shared with you ProxySQL syntax order that goes like this, the select, the from, the where, the group by, the having, the order by. This is the order in which we provide our syntax. However, the logical query processing order goes as such. The first is the from that is looked at, and then SQL looks at the where clause, next the group by, after that the having, and the select is the fifth, and then finally the order by. I'd like to go through a business scenario to start to let us think like SQL so that we can type in code that is the most efficient. So here is my business scenario. I have each of the statements in a proxy SQL query and we'll explore them one by one in the demonstration. So let's break this down one bit by bit and then see where there can be potential problems so we can understand that and prevent that going forward. The first thing I'd like to do is select the columns I want from the country table. And if I was to look at the country data set in the SGF 2020 library, the country data set has employee IDs of individuals, the country they come from, and the date in which they were hired. So this is the data set that is going to act as the source for my first query. And the first query is focused only on the select and the from. Well, I already know that the select is not the first statement that's executed. It's the first statement that SQL needs from a syntax order perspective. The from is the first statement that SQL will execute. I'm going to create a table of this query. So I have a create table statement telling SQL that I'd like to save this table in the SGF20 library as logical queue. I also have an, a nice macro here called Amper SQL OBS. You know, SQL really doesn't give you the number of rows in a query like the data step does. This macro will enable me to get the number of rows in the log. So I'm going to submit this query and take a look at the log. So the table is created with 322 rows and percent put came back with 322. Next, I'd like to use a where class, which is the second in terms of logical query processing order. I'd like to process the data and only filter for those rows, for those individuals who were hired on or after 1st of January 2009. So the select has the same columns, the from has the same table. The only difference is the addition of the where clause. I've already run through this before, and I know the number of rows I'm going to receive. And this is nine rows of data. Is it possible for me to make a mistake in coding? Yes, there is. I could just go and supply um, a select with the from and a where, and on the where clause, if you recall in an earlier section, 
we tried to use a column that was not an existing column. We tried to use a column on the select. Now you and I know that the select is the fifth to be processed, the fifth statement, the fifth action. The from is the first action and the where is the second. Now it becomes crystal clear why the where clause choked before on a column that we were building on the select. So to understand that this is a no-no, let's submit this code and examine the log. And the log returns for me an error that I've seen before in the summarizing chapter. The following columns were not found in the contributing tables here hired. So SQL is coming back very clearly and saying, I don't have access to this table. I only have access, the from is the first thing I looked at, and then on the where clause, I'm going to filter the data definitely. It's a second statement I'll execute, but I don't know what year hired is and year hired is listed on the select. SQL doesn't operate with the select yet. It has much more things to do. So something you could do to circumvent this is instead of saying year hired, you could actually type in the entire function. You could say where year of empire date and that would work like a charm. Let's head back to our code and let's add now the group by. I've modified my where clause to say, give me only those rows where empire date is on or after 1st of January 2009. In order to add the group by clause, I need some kind of summarizing. Then there is value in the group by. So in addition to country and year of empire date, I'm also going to get a count asterisk. This is going to count the number of rows for this grouping of data. The grouping that I'm interested in is country and within that year hired. So this is going to give me, as we execute this code, this gives me five rows of five groups. So let's understand what SQL is trying to tell us here. The first row, Australia, year hired is 2009, I actually had three rows of data. It collapsed into a single row. The second row of data, this group data, 2010, I had two individuals that were hired in 2010 in Australia. In the United States, 2009 saw me hire one individual. In 2010, another individual. And in 2011, we had two. Let's continue our building blocks by adding the next statement, which is the having. This time, I'd like to see which are the years in which, which is the country and within that the year hired grouping, in which I had more than one employee hired. So now that means I'm going to reduce those rows, the, Amer the United States, which had only one individual, if you look at our results, we'll validate that we'll strike through these two rows of data now, and we're only interested in rows greater than one. So I added the having clause. And in terms of the logical processing order, this is in perfect sync. The from is the first, the where is the second, the group by is the third, the having is the fourth. So let me execute this code. And as discussed, I see three rows of data with the having clause. Heading back, here is the completed code. I've also added an order by. So to recap, the select is the first, I'm sorry, the from is the first, and then the where, and then the group by. The having is the fourth, the select is the fifth, and the last one is the order by. Order by is something that is all going to order the data. So there isn't as much heavy duty processing as the other columns at the other rows. I'll submit this code. And the only difference, in fact, from the previous result in this, there isn't a lot of difference in the row data, but there is a difference in the order in which the rows appear. Now we are seeing the year hired in descending order. So 2010 first and then 2011, 
2009. In this program, I had hoped to showcase the value of beginning to think like SQL in the logical query processing order so that we can make our queries efficient and also be able to debug if we find an error show up. So in this tutorial, I had hoped to showcase the best strengths of SQL and lay out these strengths step by step. For any questions, feel free to reach out. Thanks for watching.